Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to this session on AI, AI from fiction to reality. This is, and to discuss this, we have a very uh, interesting and high-profile uh, high panel. We'll give you very different perspectives on the current and future development of AI. As you know, France and the UAE have signed a large co co collaboration agreement on AI, and the ties on this topic between the two countries are becoming stronger every day. I was lucky enough to be invited at the um, Elysee two weeks ago, uh, where the President Macron actually um, presented this strategy on AI. And uh, Eric Schmidt, the, the ex-Google CEO, encouraged uh, the startups and all the, the audience to be more uh, to be more ambitious, the French to be more ambitious, to, be, uh, to think global. So France got talent, and the UAE has ambition. So I think the match is perfect. So in this panel discussion, we will discuss uh, the state, the current state of the technology, uh, the, the impact, and also we will touch on the regulatory environment and how we need to develop uh, ethical AI. Uh, and we will finish our conversation with the outlook of AI and what the panelists believe the technology will look like in, uh, uh, like in, in uh, 10 years down the line. So. Let me first uh, introduce the panelists. We have uh, Caroline Comé-Fregno. Caroline is the VP France, Benelux and Africa of OVH Cloud. Um, with a profound understanding of cloud computing and a strong ba uh, background of I in IT, Caroline has been instrumental in driving OVH Cloud growth and innovation across these di diverse and dynamic markets. Before joining OVH Cloud, Caroline held various leadership positions in the telecom industry, notably Orange, where she honed uh, expertise in business development, strategic planning, and operation management. Her passion for technology and dedication to excellence have made her a well-respected leader in the industry. Caroline holds an engineering degree from Paris Telecom. A leadership, vision, and dedication continue to drive OVH Cloud's mission to provide reliable, secure, and scalable cloud solutions to customers worldwide. So Caroline, would you uh, perhaps tell us uh, more about your activities and OVH Cloud, please? Yes. Thank you. I'm very happy to be with you today. So uh, you mentioned Africa, but also Middle East is very important. And actually, uh, today uh, we have uh, OVH Cloud, so it's the only European hyperscalers uh, in the top 10 uh, industry. When you look at uh, cloud, uh, the only other are either American provider or Chinese provider. So we really want to propose something different, uh, consistent with our value and with all the data uh, uh, with all our commitment around data protection, which is very key. Um, today, so uh, France is of course a big part of the revenue of OVH Cloud, but we are expanding worldwide. We have today data centers in Asia, in America, and in many destinations in Europe. But uh, what is very important is that we are going to invest in 2025 to our first local zone, so local data centers in Qatar and uh, Emirates. Uh, so it will happen in the first half of 25. We know that sovereignty is very very important uh, uh, for, 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 for the countries, also the Gulf countries. That's why we want to be able to, to, to offer that possibilities to our existing and future customers. Thank, Thank you, you, Caroline. Next to, uh, next to me is Dr. Ramzi ben Wagram, who is the Director of Research and Development and Partnership at Mohamed Ben Zaid uh, University of AI. With a strong background in artificial intelligence and a commitment to advanci advancing AI research, Ramzi plays a pivotal role in positioning MBZ UAI as a leading institution in the field of AI. Ramzi's academic journey and professional career are marked by significant contribution to the field of AI. He holds a PhD in artificial intelligence from the uh, University of Compiègne, and his research has been widely published. His expertise spans various domains of AI, including machine learning, data science, and cognitive computing. 
And before joining MBZ UAI, Ramzi spent over 13 years at IBM, where he was the CTO for Middle East and Africa. And before that, 11 years at ELOG uh, e at IBM. His work focused on cloud, data security, and AI. He is a member of the advisory committee of UTC Compiègne and a regular public speaker. So, Ramzi, tell us a bit more, perhaps, about MBZ uh, UAI, which is uh, a bit of a unique uh, type of university. Yes. Thank you very much. So, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you here. Uh, so, Mohammed Ibn Zayed University of Artificial Intelligence is the first and unique university that is specialized in AI. Uh, so, the university started uh, around four years ago, uh, during COVID, actually. And uh, this is, it didn't stop, in fact, the university because the UAE has a vision of developing AI uh, and they have as part of their strategy, actually, the UAE is the only country today that have a minister of AI and that started in 2017. So to give you the importance of this domain uh, for the country and for the region. Uh, so university, uh, we, uh, we, uh, we brought in experts from all over the world. Uh, today, we are proud to be ranked number 12 or 13 in the CS ranking for the, uh, uh, among the universities in AI. Uh, so, and this is uh, in competition with the large institution in the US. There are four or five of them and, uh, and Chinese. And if we remove, in fact, these two blocks, we are number one and number two. So it's really important that this institution is, is built to attract talent, to create or to build talents but also as, a, as an institution to help industry partners to develop and the use of AI. Uh, so we will uh, we'll talk about more what we do uh, later in the, uh, in the panel, but uh, this is really a, an amazing experience and a, and a great opportunity for, uh, for a collaboration between, uh, between academia and, uh, and, uh, and the private sector. Thank you, Ramzi. And we have uh, Professor Olivier Houllier, co-founder and CEO of Inclusive Brain and chairman of the Institute of Artificial Intelligence by Biotech Dental. Inclusive Brains develops mod mod multimodal cognitive AI agents and neural foundation model to enable all connected device and digital environment to adapt in real time on how their user feel and to predict and assist them to improve performance, inclusion, as well as physical and mental health. His previous roles involve being a member of the executive committee of the World Economic Forum in charge of global health and healthcare industries, president of Emotive, the Californian-based global leader in hard hardware brain sensing technology, and head of the French minister's neuroscience and public policy program. Often deemed the European Neuralink in the media, Inclusive Brain received extensive global media coverage lately because of the Prometheus BCI, their global partnership with Allianz Trade, that was used for two world premieres. The first one was a mind control Olympic torch relay that took place in Marseille in partnership with Région Sud. And the second one was last Friday from the stage of the United Nations AI for Good Summit, where they wrote and sent a tweet to President Macron only with mental and phys uh, physiological comments. President Ma Macron was very impressed and he replied and congratulated them for their achievements. So, Olivier, a few more words about um, Inclusive Brain and what you're doing. Thank you very much for having me. With my co-founder, Paul Barbas, at Inclusive Brain, we have one mission. We want machines to adapt to people and not the other way around. And in order to do that, we need to empower machines to process information, to understand information, just like the human brain does. So we're training our AI models with brain waves, facial expressions, eye movements, um, vocal intonation, and a lot of other, other data in order to really adapt to people. Because for a lot of people, generative AI these days means text, generating text. But there is so much to how we interact with machine, uh, but text. I don't know about you, but um, my car is an amazing connected device. It can pick up whether I'm tired, 
distracted, it avoids collision, it prevents me from crossing lines, and helps me with a bunch of tedious tasks, just like parallel parking. I always wonder, how come my workstation does not offer me these kind of services? Why is it just my car that is taking care of my physical and my mental health? And this is one of our missions at Inclusive Brains, to be able for machines to adapt to people, regardless of their physicality, their abilities, their needs, however special they might be. And this is why we can pick up in real time very accurate measures of stress, attention, cognitive load and fatigue, but also we have helped people who have, because of accidents of their lives, or um, neurodegenerative disease, lost the ability to use a limb to speak so that we empower them to control connected device and um, digital environments only with the power of their minds or with the power of their minds combined with all other kinds of control that do not require to speak, to touch, or to move. And this is our vision for inclusive AI and uh, technology in general. Thank you very much. Uh, so as I, uh, as I told you, that uh, it's going to be a, a very uh, interesting and very uh, uh, amazing conversation. I just um, say a few words about myself. Uh, I'm currently the executive director of Sky in Abu Dhabi. Sky stands for Sorbonne Center for Artificial Intelligence. It's a cross-disciplinary uh, entity aiming at sharing AI expertise uh, across various sectors. So I work in close relationship with Sky in Paris and a network of 130 labs um, on many different topics, epidemiology, actuarial science, robotics, humanity, legal. Um, I'm also an investor in blockchain and Web3 technology. I have an engineering background, and I'm passionate about technology and innovation, uh, fascinate, uh, fasc uh, fascinated by the impact that it has on society and humankind. And that's why I'm such a strong believer in the benefit of AI. So without further ado, let me ask um, Caroline the first, uh, the first question in terms of uh, advancement and, uh, and uh, the current state of the technology, because infrastructure is the first, um, is the foundation for everything else, isn't it? Yes, exactly. And this is because we have had a huge progress on the computing part, thanks to GPU, that today we have the, the kind of, of tools we can uh, do, all used with chatbots that are quite powerful to generate content. But it's not so easy to access to this infrastructure because everybody is looking for it. Uh, I'm talking about the GPUs, and there is one leader, uh, this is NVIDIA, that has a very high market share, more than 80%, and everybody is competing to have access to this GPU. So this is first one stake, uh, shortage, competition, pressure. But when you've got this GPU, what do you need? You need power, and it's a lot of power, much more power than traditional computing. And here, coming back to, to do what we said here this morning, there is a question of sustainability. So first, it's much better if we can rely on renewable energy and if we can also optimize the usage of uh, power, because otherwise it will be tremendous uh, quantity of powers that will be required to run that GPUs. And on top of that, you need to cool the infrastructure because it's high temperature. And here, there is a need of water because we always use water. With Innovage Cloud, we have developed our own technology that is called water cooling. It's uh, recycled water and it's very powerful because we use seven, ten times less water than traditional air cooling. And I think this is something very important because we optimize the usage of water, but also the, the usage of power. And if we really want to develop, and we are just at the beginning of the story in terms of infrastructure, we need to think on how we can optimize the resources to be sure that the impact on the environment will be as limited as possible. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Caroline. Uh, Ramzi uh, Mohamed Ben Zaid University, it's a new university, as you said, and it counts now among the, the best universities in the world. Um, one of the focus of MBZ UAA was to develop their own language model in Arabic, the model JACE, 
Um, so please perhaps tell us a bit about the lesson learned during this uh, in terms of model size, input data set and so on, and how it impacts the direction of research and what are the recent development in the field. Absolutely, yes. So uh, in the previous panel, uh, one of the uh, one of the, uh, the the person was uh, complaining about the fact that we don't have a large language model on Arabic. So I'm re very pleased to say that we have that. We have that uh, made in the, in the GCC, made uh, made in the UAE. Uh, so we built what is a, la a large language model that is trained on Arabic which means that the major data that has been trained on was Arabic. Obviously, it was trained on other languages. But what is important here when you have large language models, you train them, the quality of the large language model will is coming from the data that, that you are training uh, the model on. Uh, so here we have uh, a very efficient and very uh, uh, performing uh, large language model that is built for Arabic and for Arabic uh, language use cases. And at the university, we don't just do this. So what, with the surge of generative AI, uh, we thought that it is important really to help uh, the community, to help the users to adopt these kind of technologies. Uh, so we created the uh, Foundational Model Institute within the university because uh, it's important to join forces from the different researchers to address these generative AI, AI challenges. Uh, I'm sure that the majority of you have already used ChatGPT or, uh, or Gemini or any other of these uh, large language models. They are great, they are very efficient and do certain things. When it comes to deploy them into the, uh, into the enterprise, then you have a different challenges like uh, data residency, like uh, uh, you want to train the model to have to be efficient, uh, to do exactly the use case of the task that you used to do in your enterprise. And this is a big challenge in terms of adoption. Uh, so what we are doing here at the university, we are helping uh, industry partners to build their own GPT, which means that if you want to have uh, a language model that, that is uh, addressing exactly using your data, uh, addressing, delivering your use case that you want to deliver, so we can help you choosing the right base language model so there are a number of uh, a variety of uh, open language models that we can fine tune and train. Uh, and this is something that we help industry partners to adopt because we believe it's important to own your own language so that you can train it, that you can adjust the responses that, uh, uh, that it, it gives. And it's more, much more efficient because with such language model, we call them, by the way, small language models to uh, uh, to the opposition to the large language models, you can deploy them within your infrastructure so the data res residency uh, is not impacted. The security also is, uh, 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 is, uh, is, uh, is respected. Uh, so this is really where we are seeing a lot of partnership and collaboration we have with, uh, with industry partners. Uh, so there are other areas also that, uh, that we are working on around healthcare. Uh, again, so I was uh, really listening to the previous uh, uh, to the previous uh, panel, and for us, this is one of our uh, focus area. Uh, we're building also foundation models uh, that can uh, deal with these healthcare uh, information. So healthcare information, not just numbers. Uh, you have imagery, you have uh, ultrasound, you have a number of uh, modality. And we're building these models that are multi-model that can understand images, videos, and sounds together with, sound, uh, with text uh, to really interpret, help doing the diagnosis, help building, in fact, these, uh, these solutions to serve our community and, uh, uh, and to, to all the people. Yeah, and I think that's also what you're working on, uh, Professor Olivier, in terms of, uh, of inclusive brain and uh, to, to, uh, to uh, counteract or mitigate the impact of uh, neurodegenerative disease, but also other applications that you were uh, mentioning. So can you tell us a bit more about uh, your, your, the research and what, your, uh, what uh, inclusive brain does? Sure, we are a science-based company, and I think that's important to, to stress, that this is a for-profit business. 
but you can do for profit and have positive impact. We really firmly believe that with Paul. When I, we co-founded Inclusive Brains, it's actually a, it's a story that started in Dubai. Um, in 2017, uh, with my, the, the technology from the company I was the president of in California, Emotive, was used for a person with quadriplegia to mind control a real Formula One on a real racetrack in Brazil. The year after, we were invited to tell the story in Dubai at an event where Lewis Hamilton was present. And with Rodrigo, my friend who uh, mind controlled the Formula One, we challenged Lewis Hamilton to a mind control race. And it's this very video of the challenge that Paul Barbas saw in France and Paul and I later, I will spare you all the details, but found it inclusive brains because of what he saw and what I saw, what I saw in the possibility from a very special event, a one-off event, to span a technology that could impact the world. Paul and I, we do not dream about being astronauts. We do not dream about being rock stars or DJs. We dream about the remote control. The remote control was invented to help people with disabilities change the channels on their TV sets. Look at what it became. It changed the way all of us interact with technology. All of us. Plus, it's a massive market. So something that started as an assistive tech become, became one of the biggest markets you can think of. And this is what we aim to achieve with Inclusive Brains. We can do very positive impact for people with disabilities, but develop technologies that can benefit everybody with zero discrimination whatsoever. What happened a few weeks ago in Marseille, where someone who not only had a motor disability, but also cognitive impairment, and who was not able to do those mental commands that we had uh, developed for her, we managed to tailor a solution so that the only two emotions she could do on demand could be detected by artificial intelligence and opened a way for her to trigger the movement of an exoskeleton that allowed her to reach the Olympic torch and participate in the torch relay. This technology is called Prometheus BCI, and we developed it, uh, Inclusive Brain, together with Alliance Trade that allowed us not only to develop the technology, but to go further than just one-off events, to be able to use this technology in order to totally transform the workplace. First, by including people with disabilities and giving them the ability to mind control a workstation or a vehicle so that people who are excluded from the workplace and from social life because of a disability, have access to education, have access to work. And then, to leverage this technology with Alliance Trade in order to improve safety in the workplace, physical and mental safety, equally important. And we're trying to keep on being inspired by the remote control and its path from an assistive technology to the mass uh, impact. Why? Because overall, technology and AI, in particular, are assistive technologies. They are here to serve us, by us, for us. Thank you. Yeah, that's very, very inspiring. And as we are going to touch on the ethics and the regulatory uh, points, uh, perhaps I stay with you, uh, Professor, for this uh, next topic. Europe is the first country to regulate AI, and uh, the AI Act has just been uh, passed, is in place since uh, March 2024. It's based on a risk, risk approach. That means that depending on the risk that the AI system presents, it will be, um, it will be regulated differently. Obviously, high risk will, will, uh, uh, will trigger higher compliance and uh, higher uh, rules. Um, your work falls into the high-risk category, and I know you have very strong views about uh, the impact that this kind of uh, regulatory uh, environment um, has on your business. So can you just tell us a bit more on what you think and how, how this uh, regulation should be improved, basically? It's very kind of you to mention where we fall with some of our AI models. But there is a kind of irony that a model that allows a person 
to interact with the world, a person with disability is deemed high risk. But it illustrates part of the issue. The issue is in a lot of cases, not just talking about uh, Europe, regulation is focusing on the technology rather than the outcomes. You can do a lot of things with a hammer. You can build a house or you can harm someone. Shall we regulate hammers based on the fact that some people are going to harm other people? Maybe not, but yet it needs to be taken into account. And there is something called for that, the law. The first thing I would like to stress is a certain irony or paradox, if I may say, when I see how vivid the conversation is, to say the least, in regulating high technology that has not done any damage yet, that could do damage, and seeing that there is low technology that has been used as a weapon of mass discrimination, regardless of its lack of scientific validation, that is used worldwide. You might wonder what I'm talking about. I'm talking about questionnaires, personality tests, cognitive tests that are widely used in the HR world in order to categorize people, to discriminate people, to prevent some people to have access to a job. Yet, since the 1970s, there is scientific literature that shows they are unreliable, that their predictive power is extremely low, but they are used at large scale. My first ask is for high-tech and low-tech to be equally regulated. First, based on the outcome. You can discriminate people with a paper and a pencil. You can discriminate people based on AI models. What is important here is not the paper, the pencil, or the AI model. It's discrimination, the outcome. And that is something for me that needs to be at the core of any effort, be it regulatory, legal, but also ethical. Because beyond what we're talking in terms of regulation, AI for good, positive impact, entails that everybody should have access to a technology. A technology can only have in, an impact if it's being used by people. And this is why, in addition to the commercial arm of what we're doing in our partnership with Valiance Trade, the hardware technology, the exoskeleton, will be given for free to organizations that are non-for-profit and support people with disability. This is why our mental command algorithm will be put open source so that everybody who wants to help people with special needs can benefit, use it, and create their own solution. There is the regu regulation is one part. Access is the second part. And of course, outcome and the quality, the impact, and the measurement of outcome is something that should be taken into account as well. In terms of ethics at MBZ as an, an educational institution, uh, what is done at uh, this level to ensure that the practice, uh, the best practice in terms of development, in terms of uh, transparency, fairness, absence yes. of bias, how do you ensure that um, these best practices are developed and used? Uh, yeah, and beyond the university, a... actually, for any uh, organization that is producing or using AI, uh, it's important to put the safe uh, or the guardrails, in fact, in your organization. Uh, so it's important to have what we call an AI ethic board. Uh, this uh, board that should be uh, should, that should come from diverse ethnicities, ethnicity and uh, and culture uh, so to avoid to avoid in fact certain culture biases uh, but it's really important for every single organization to take an accountability to take an accountability of what you are producing and how you are putting these uh, to your client or to to your users uh, so the ai ethic board is a, is an important institution in those organizations uh, and they have the mission and they have the responsibility to decide and and uh, uh, and enforce uh, decisions whether to go to implement such ai or not and to put, to make sure that you have the safe uh, uh, the, the the safeguard or the guardrails to make, to make sure that the technology will not be misused it's really important and this is something that we have uh, uh, that we have uh, put at the university, and I'm sure that uh, 
all large uh, AI institutions, in fact, have a similar uh, similar organization. But also, you need to define your uh, uh, your boundaries. So, what kind of technology, what kind of uh, use that you will not do or that you will be doing? Uh, for us, uh, for instance, uh, an example at the university, uh, anything to do with weaponry or hurting other people. Uh, we decided that this is something that we will not do and will never do, uh, doing AI to harm uh, people. Uh, and then you can get requests like, uh, uh, I have an example of, uh, of, uh, of a company that came to ask to build an AI uh, for preaching. And this was a good case to put in front of the AI ethic board because do we want to build AI that will change or influence the belief of people? It is a really a question mark. And this is, shows really the limits where you need to, to have this kind of institution to give you the yes or no answer and to explain and be transparent in those decisions. So obviously the answer was no in this case, but uh, it is important to have these kinds of institutions uh, to uh, uh, to, to help giving these guys on top of the uh, AI acts or any regulations coming from, uh, from the various government. Now, talking about the usability, so, uh, and this is maybe a bit uh, a side discussion or maybe it is a limited to, uh, it, is, uh, it is related to the use of uh, AI for everyone. Uh, obviously, with these large language models, uh, with the prominence of the English language, uh, certain cultures, certain uh, uh, countries are completely left behind. Uh, so if you go to Africa, to Central Africa, where you have tens of dialects or, uh, or you go to Asia, these countries are underserved by AI the way that the, uh, the rest of the countries are. So for us, it's important to make sure that we provide this kind of technology. We build, in fact, these, uh, uh, these technology to serve these countries. So we are working, uh, uh, again, on, uh, on a language model uh, to help with the Arabic dialects because we have uh, uh, around uh, 30 plus dialects across the region, uh, I think even more. Uh, and it's important also to serve these uh, people who are only using the uh, the language, the speaking language, rather than the writing to uh, uh, to leverage AI. So it's important to have uh, these capabilities. We are doing partnerships with uh, uh, with organizations in Africa and Asia to help also building these language models for uh, for these. Uh, 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 minor languages, if I may say. Uh, underrepresented, uh, but, yes. Uh, underrepresented, Commun thank you. It's community, better. yes. Thanks. Very good. Thank you. And uh, Carolina, uh, this new regulation also impacts the infrastructure and the cloud infrastructure. I imagine that the challenge are about ensuring data privacy, data security, uh, that the, the data doesn't travel, I mean, the topic of data residency, sovereignty, and so on. So can you just uh, explain, elaborate a bit on this uh, topic in terms of uh, cloud and infrastructure, please? Yes, of course. So yes, uh, as we said before, uh, the fuel of uh, in artificial intelligence is data on top of the computing capacities. And so you need to give, to have access to your data uh, to train new models, to improve the way you're going to use uh, artificial intelligence. And as end users also, you will rely on, uh, uh, on AI like chatbot. But we are, you have to be careful. You have to be careful some companies, and I will not say the name, but a big uh, Asian company uh, at the beginning of, with the launch of ChatGPT, some uh, researchers have used ChatGPT, put some data in ChatGPT, and after that, they, they have seen that uh, some very uh, sensitive information were available on the internet. You have to know each time you give data to a, a chatbot that is available on the internet, is storing your data, taking your data, and at, it can give back this data to everybody that can access the chatbot. So as a company, and even as a personal, uh, as an individual, you need to think on how you, which kind of data you are ready to give to a, to a, to a long, large language model available on the internet, a chatbot, 
or you want to keep within your company, you want to keep private. And there are solutions to build private environment your, where you will use your data, you can access your data with some models you are going, going to select. But this is very important to integrate that and each company as to, to, to see how it's going to, 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 to use AI in a safe environment. So that's more about risk management. And after that, of course, there is regulation that is coming on top of that. So in Europe, we have GDPR. Uh, we have also, uh, uh, in France, uh, this is a specificity that is called Secnum Cloud. Uh, why do we have this highest level of uh, security and sovereignty concerning uh, data? It's because we know it's not sufficient to know where the data are localized. Very often people told me, you know, we are going to have data hosted in our country, that's sufficient to protect the data. But in reality it's not, because uh, in some countries we are, we, we, you have extraterritorial laws that uh, make it mandatory for the providers to give access to the state to data that are stored in other countries, extraterritorial laws, uh, everybody knows the Patriot Act, Cloud Act, or FISA, that are very powerful laws. And so it, it means it's, you have to also integrate that dimension when you say we want to have so data sovereignty to protect the data. Uh, this is not only about location, but who is managing your data and, and how, which laws uh, are uh, applied to this provider. So that's mainly the point. So risk management and regulation, yeah. Thank you, uh, thank you all. This is very insightful and so insightful that we are running actually a bit late. So let's go quickly to the next point because that's the most uh, exciting one. Uh, the outlook, outlook of AI. So uh, Caroline, what do you see in the crystal ball? So first, uh, I think AI is going to be everywhere, changing all uh, our job, our life. Uh, I think coming back to what uh, Ramsey said, it's very important to have local uh, ecosystem, local solution to, to be sure that it fits with your language, your culture. So, and for that, uh, there is nothing better than to sustain startup in your environment. And I hope also we will have uh, some big progress on the sustainability part, and maybe quantum can be uh, one of the on the solution to really have high uh, computing, uh, very efficient computing capabilities to sustain AI. So that's my point. Thank you, Hamzi. So there is no need to read the crystal ball. Uh, it's already a reality. Uh, I think uh, well, the, re the, the, the yes, one of the reasons that we are here talking about AI, it's really because it's touching uh, everyone, uh, uh, every one of us. Uh, for, for us, we, we see the use of AI is, uh, is everywhere. Uh, actually, one story, uh, I, was, uh, uh, I was in discussion with, uh, with one person that I met here, and uh, she's an uh, expert uh, in uh, equestrian uh, uh, domain. Uh, and uh, I just showed with her a proposal that we made yesterday. It's how to improve uh, the performance of uh, horse racing uh, using AI. So, so here, really, the use cases are endless. Uh, the opportunity is here. It is disturbing. It is disturbing. Uh, but when there is, uh, there is, uh, <laughs> there is, the, the, yes, uh, disturbance, or uh, it's, uh, there, there's an opportunity. So for us, uh, the, uh, the future is really to make AI available to everyone. Uh, it's really important for us. That's why we're building uh, open, uh, open model, a transparent open model. Uh, the reason why it's important here is that we give the, mo the language model, but we give the recipe how we built it. What's the data that we have used? Because in this language model uh, arena, uh, some models, they claim to be open model, but in reality, you cannot reproduce them. You don't know exactly how they were trained. Uh, so for us, it's important to provide, in fact, these transparent and, uh, and fully open model. Uh, so again, uh, we are, we're also incorporating the multimodality I was mentioning earlier. It's not just text-based. Uh, now you can incorporate videos, images, and voices, and so it will expand or increase the use case that it can address. 
so this is uh, this is really our future, and I think the future is bright. We just need to embrace AI. And you, Olivier? I don't make predictions. Only people who don't understand AI will tell you in five years this is what is going to happen. If you listen to the luminaries, the leading lights on AI, they make zero prediction with timestamps because no one predicted the, the, the speed, the accuracy, the, the spread of what happened. So I'm going to share wishes with you. The first wish I have is that we anchor regulation development in reality. First, absence of bias does not exist. Neutrality does not exist. Objectivity does not exist. So let's stop trying to make things that do not exist and anchor things in reality. Does that mean that we shouldn't fight biases? That we shouldn't develop safeguards? Absolutely not. But we need to be aware of a reality. Second is I hope you're going to invite me again next year and we will not be talking about AI, but we will be talking about outcomes. If I were an architect, whether I would have designed the building on paper or with a computer would not matter. What would matter is the building, whether you like it or not, whether this building is useful or not, whether it was made in an ethical fashion or not, whether it's legal or not, what I did. This is what matters. And the last wish, uh, is that AI will be used for the one thing we need to use it for, assisting us, but reducing inequalities. Access to healthcare, and all these things that can be fantastic. And now let's ground it in reality, can be very lucrative markets, because that's important too, reducing inequalities. Yeah, safe and fair AI. Um, we had planned to open the floor for questions, but we have very little time. I don't know if uh, the organizer wants us to do that or how does that work. Do you have any questions first? Yes, they want us to answer questions. Okay. <laughs> so, do we have any questions? I have a question for you, Olivier. <laughs> no, you talked about the two emotions that the, this uh, lady was uh, could uh, could be detected in in the lady, so that she can carry the the flame. So, where what were these two emotions? So, Natalie, is her name, was together with her twin brother Denis, who is driving the electric wheelchair. Natalie cannot do a voluntary movement. And she could do two things. She could blow a kiss, and she could open her mouth and smile. So we created a detection that used her brain waves, used her facial muscle, and also the vision of her facial expression in order to trigger this movement. But the beauty of it is that her twin brother also has an impairment. He has autism, and he is afraid of crowds which for the Olympic torch relay and thousands and thousands of people around is a bit tricky. You... So we use the technology, brain sensing technology that I released uh, more than five years ago with my previous company. Just a little uh, you know, shout out to them because uh, Apple and Meta just released their patents last year and we did it in 2019. Uh, in order to monitor his stress level in real time, and to be able to talk to him and just to help him handle his fear. So the technology that day was used to help someone who would have been excluded from the Olympic torch relay to participate and to do it in, with a certain level of autonomy, but also the technology was used in order to help someone deal with what life face, you know, offers him, which is not so easy. And those two emotions, the, the smile and the kiss, I encourage you to have a look at Natalie's face when there is this torch kiss. is one of the most emotional moments of my life. Thank you. I think on this beautiful story, uh, we, we, we close this panel discussion. Thank you. And uh, thank you very much. And thank you, Valerie, for moderating the session. Thank you.